So as I was saying, thank you so much for uh, allowing me the opportunity to talk to everybody today about a topic that's really dear and dear to my heart. Uh, as you were saying, I am a neurosurgeon at Vanderbilt University, and uh, that's in Nashville, Tennessee. Most of my clinical practice really centers around uh, patients with brain tumors, but one of my other real pet area of interest is in traumatic brain injury. And part of that comes from my own experiences as an equestrian. Um, so long before I ever went to medical school and, and became a neurosurgeon, uh, I was very involved in the equestrian world, um, grew up on a uh, boarding and breeding farm, was an A-pony clubber, and, and uh, was mainly an eventer up to about the two-star level. Uh, but I also dabbled in dressage and jumpers and lots of other stuff as well. And my own philosophy about helmet use and uh, concussion and brain injury has really changed with my professional training. And so one of the things that's really sort of a pet project of mine is to try to bring some of that understanding to other folks out there that uh, don't have the opportunity to see patients and uh, learn about these things in the way that I do. Um, my plan today is uh, to kind of give you guys first a few definitions about some of the uh, key terms that you need to know to understand this particular disease. I'm also going to talk some about the incidence of traumatic brain injury and in equestrian sport in particular. I'm going to go through some key steps about how we diagnose brain injury in athletes as well as how we treat it and what you can expect as the outcome. And then I'm going to go into one of my pet areas again and get on my soapbox and talk about a few of the uh, issues that I think are facing the equestrian community that I think are really important and that I'm hoping we're really poised to be able to answer. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the work of advocacy groups like Riders for Helmets that have really made this uh, an issue that's in the forefront of the equestrian's minds in a way that it wasn't before, and I'm very thankful for that. So I'm going to jump right in. First of all, there's a term I'm going to use a lot today, which is TBI. TBI stands for Traumatic Brain Injury. Basically, this runs the spectrum from a very mild brain injury, like a mild concussion, where there's a complete recovery, to a severe brain injury that can lead to persistent vegetative state, coma, or even death. And basically, a traumatic brain injury is any injury to the brain which produces either or both structural and functional alterations. Now, that's very different than a concussion. It's a big umbrella term. A concussion is one of the diagnoses that's under that umbrella. A concussion is defined as a transient trauma-induced alteration in brain function, not a structural abnormality. One of the most important things to say right off the bat that sometimes people are, are confused about is that a concussion does not require a blow to the head and it doesn't require a loss of consciousness. Acceleration and deceleration injuries to the brain can produce concussion even when you've not had any blow whatsoever. And uh, in fact, only about 10% of people with concussions actually lose consciousness. I always like to get those out of the way first. So I like to kind of get give people an idea of exactly how big the problem is that we're dealing with. And TBIs in general are an incredibly large problem, uh, an incredibly expensive problem, and an incredibly challenging problem to treat in the U.S. and elsewhere. They see about 1.7 million TBIs annually in this country. Uh, about 1.4 are treated and released. 4 million are treated and released from the emergency room. So they're thus relatively mild. But a lot of those patients are hospitalized, and it's important to note the last few figures, 80,000 80, people yearly are permanently disabled from traumatic brain injury, and 50,000 traumatic brain injuries result in death annually in the country alone. Of those, almost half are actually sports-related. So, you know, we think of severe brain injury and motorcycle accidents and car accidents and all sorts of falls and things like that, but in fact, a big part of the problem is recreational and professional sports. Highest incidence is, as you would expect, in those folks in their adolescence and early adulthood. That is in part probably because of uh, just the nature of the activities that they're in at that time, but it also has to do with their sensitivity to severe brain injury, which peaks during childhood. In terms of equestrian sports, the news doesn't really get any better. Uh, riding causes almost 12% of all traumatic brain injuries amongst recreational sports, and that's the highest percentage of any recreational sport. 14,000 ER visits in the last year that we have a uh, number score for brain injuries amongst riders. Head injuries um, are involved in almost 20% of equestrian injuries, and not surprisingly, they're the number one reason for hospital admission. They are the cause of death in 60% of equestrian fatalities. It's a pretty staggering figure. 
other the other major things that we see that that can cause equestrian fatalities are really cervical spine injuries and crush injuries to the chest. But head injuries, by and large, lead that charge. The most significant factor in predicting injury severity is not how long you've been riding. It's not uh, what type of horse you're riding. It's not what kind of riding you're doing. It's the height of the fall. And then, of course, whether or not you're wearing a helmet. In terms of discipline, TBIs are equally common in English and Western disciplines. Uh, the disciplines with the highest incidence of TBI are eventing and racing, obviously, where speed plays a big part. So this is a statistic that sort of horrified me when I saw it, because I would never think of getting on a motorcycle. I've seen lots of patients in motorcycle injury accidents and always thought, well, that's just something, I, that's a thrill I just don't need to have in my life. But a motorcycle rider can expect to suffer a serious injury for every 5,000 hours of riding. An equestrian should expect to suffer a serious injury for every 350 hours of riding. So what we're doing is really pretty dangerous. I think that's the first education point that's got to get out there, especially for recreational riders, backyard riders who might be putting their kids on a horse and thinking that it's not really that big of a deal because they grew up you know, jumping on a horse bareback without a helmet on and, and they survived. Fortunately, the situation is a little bit more serious than that. Uh, every once in a while, you know, we hear on the news about a football player that's died from a head injury. Sometimes it's a high school player or a college player, and it's usually a pretty big story. There's eight deaths per year due to head injury in football across all levels of football play in the United States. There are 60 deaths per year due to head injury in equestrian sports. And I can't remember the last time I ever heard about one of those on the television. So this is really an under-recognized phenomenon. So I want to get into briefly kind of some of the types of traumatic brain injury that we see commonly in riders, uh, just to give folks sort of an idea of uh, what some of these things are that are out there. And in case you ever heard about somebody having one, you've had one yourself, um, or you know you have the opportunity, an unfortunate opportunity, to have to see one of these things in the future, so you have an idea of, um, of how we treat these. So I'm going to talk through some of the common things: skull fractures, intracranial hematomas contusions and shear hemorrhages, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about concussions, because that's probably the most relevant for most of us. First of all, if you're schooling, if you're having a lesson, if you're spectating at an event or jump judging, and you see a rider that's fallen and appears to be unconscious, what do you do? The first thing to remember is that head injuries and spine injuries often go hand in hand. And so anytime you see somebody where you suspect a head injury, you've always got to think about a spine injury as well and be very careful moving that patient. Of course, you're going to call 911 for any unconscious rider that you see or anybody who's acting really unusual right off the bat. Uh, or obviously, if you're at a competition, you may be able to call the on-site paramedic. And those folks are going to think through the ABCs first and foremost, getting an airway, making sure the patient's breathing, making sure that the heart is doing what it needs to do to pump blood around the body. So neurosurgeons don't usually have too much to do with that immediate, those immediate life-saving measures. But where we get involved is when folks get from the field of play to the emergency room. One of the things that we can see fairly commonly uh, are skull fractures. And sometimes these can be very minor and don't have to have anything done about them at all. Sometimes, like in this example, they can be pretty serious. And uh, they can require operative fixation and cause brain injury themselves. And skull fractures are one of the things that riders are, are very much at risk for, uh, and one of the things that helmets do an absolutely fantastic job of preventing. So this is one of the real areas of success with the helmets that we have right now. Skull fractures, just so you know, cannot be diagnosed by palpating the head. So just because somebody's head feels OK does not mean they have a skull fracture. They don't always have a, a cut over them. Uh, sometimes everything looks OK, but there's a pretty significant underlying fracture. They can occur even with a very mild brain injury or no brain injury at all. The way we diagnose them is usually in the emergency department by CAT scan. And as I said, helmets reliably reduce the risk of skull fractures across a wide variety of sports. And certainly our helmets in equestrian sports have been shown to do that very well. Um, there's a specific type of skull fracture that's pretty common in riders. And this is called a basilar skull fracture. And that basically means a fracture to the base of your skull. Uh, these things can often present in a delayed fashion. Uh, you don't necessarily know this has happened right off the bat, but if you ever hear of somebody a day or two after a fall complaining of hearing loss, of feeling really off balance, or having any clear, watery drainage from the nose or the ear, or the loss of smell or taste, those are all signs that are very suspicious that need to be worked up for a possible skull fracture at the base of the skull. 
In addition, there are a couple common signs. Folks tend to get really bad black eyes with this and bruising over the mastoid process, which is the bump behind your ear. This is what that looks like. That's sort of the idea of the raccoon eyes and um, that battle sign, which is that bruising over the mastoid process. And those are both highly suspicious and need to be worked up by a physician. This is a very unfortunate and unattractive self-portrait of myself after I got a basilar skull fracture um, while riding in a novice level event uh, just not too long ago. Um, so this is, uh, that was actually my second basilar skull fracture, I have to say. Uh, hopefully those of you that are out here listening um, uh, have been riding uh, long enough that you probably had one of these, one or two of these sorts of things happen yourself. The last time I gave one of these talks at uh, Helmet Symposium Live, when I asked how many people in the room had ever had a concussion, uh, I think every single hand was in the air. So unfortunately, this is something that a lot of us are pretty familiar with personally. On the more serious side of things, um, one of the things that we get very excited about as neurosurgeons um, are intracranial hematomas, or blood clots on the outside of the brain. Uh, these are um, can be called epidural hematomas or subdural hematomas, and these are pretty classic. Uh, Patients will usually, or athletes will usually have a fall. They may seem okay for a little while, which is called the lucid interval. Uh, their symptoms seem pretty mild, and then they deteriorate rapidly. Some of those symptoms when they deteriorate are severe headache with nausea and vomiting. Uh, they're very sleepy. All they want to do is go to bed and lie down, and then they'll just be just fine, what they tell you. Uh, one of their pupils can start to enlarge. That's a really bad sign. Things are going downhill and they begin to develop what we call lateralizing signs, which means one side of the body is getting weak, the other side is okay. That's also a really bad last minute kind of sign. Uh, usually these things are gonna present within, if, they're, if they're severe within a period of minutes to hours. Rarely we see somebody a day or two after an injury that comes in with one of these. Um, I've got a picture down there in the corner of Natasha Richardson. Some of you all may remember the story of her from a few years ago. Uh, where she was skiing up in Canada, had a fall, got checked out by the uh, by the ski patrol, wanted just wanted to go back and lie down in her hotel room, went back, lay down, and next thing you know, somebody checked on her an hour or two later, and um, she was very, very, very severely ill. By the time they got her to the hospital, uh, this hematoma that she had of this type had enlarged so much that um, even doing surgery for it was not successful in her case. So this is sort of the thing that gets us uh, jumping out of bed in the middle of the night um, to get these patients taken care of. Contusions uh, are another common intracranial injury that we see after sports-related trauma. Basically, a contusion of the brain is not very different than a contusion of another part of the body. It's essentially just a bruise. Uh, they usually indicate that there's focal damage to the brain structure at that location, not necessarily at other locations within the head. The big problem we have with these when they're severe, as the, one in, the ones in uh, the CT scan that I have up are, is that they tend to swell. And they tend to swell the most between days two and day five. If you've ever had uh, a fall and you've gotten a really big bruise on your hip or whatnot, you know, it looks kind of awful when you go to bed and then you wake up and next thing you know, you know, your, your whole side is purple and yellow and awful looking and that doesn't go away overnight. Well, contusions in the brain do the same thing. And the problem is the brain sits in a fixed cavity, and the skull doesn't expand. So when these contusions start to swell, it causes elevations in the pressure inside your head, or your intracranial pressure, and that can lead to coma and even death in some cases. So this is another problem that we have to work very hard on in the trauma ICU to the office. Shear hemorrhages are something you'll occasionally hear about, and you can see some, an example of a patient with multiple shear hemorrhages. They're the bright spots here on the CT scan. Uh, these are associated with rapid acceleration or deceleration injury or rotational injuries. Rarely associated really with uh, blows to the head, but we see them in car accidents and we see them in people that have had a blow to the head because of a rapid acceleration as well. So sometimes we do see these in riders too. Sometimes you just see a couple of little dots there and they don't really look that bad, but they actually indicate there is severe injury to the axons, which are the conduction fibers of the brain. And sometimes you can see just one or two little dots in the CT scan and things don't look very bad at all, but a patient may wind up comatose, persistent vegetative state, and even die because it's basically kind of a harbinger of a worse underlying injury than you can see on a scan. So how do we diagnose all of these things? Well, as a neurosurgeon, you know, I start off with my clinical exam, which is usually rapid, uh, but I basically 
try to get a sense of how responsive a patient is, how well they're moving, are, is their brain stem working, are their lower uh, neurologic functions working, their motor, uh, motor exam in the arms and legs, et cetera. Very rapidly, we usually get an imaging test. These days, in most emergency rooms, it's going to be a CT scan first. That's really good at looking for those things that are going to get you in big trouble really quickly, and it's inexpensive and fast, so we start there. MRIs can be used down the line. They're usually not used first off because they take some time. They're more expensive, and uh, they're not necessarily any better than a CT at picking up a life-threatening injury. But we think that they may sometimes be useful for prognosis. So typically, in my practice, I was pretty used to always getting an MRI, and anyone that had a really bad exam after you know five to seven days after an injury, and trying to use that to, to get a sense of, um, of how well that patient was going to do in the long term. However, I think that the research is showing us that actually even MRIs that show a lot of structural damage may kind of be a red herring. Some of those patients actually do well. So most of us are moving away from trying to guess about a prognosis based on that study. Um, one thing that is kind of in the works from a research standpoint is a biomarker that you can test in the blood, and this is basically a, um, a portion of a protein that you can test for that may be useful in ruling out traumatic brain injury. So essentially, you can do a blood test. If this level is extremely low, you could say, okay, this person has not had a significant brain injury. If it's high, that may mean they've had a brain injury, but it's not all that specific. Um, some folks are using this in a research protocol to follow this on a day-to-day -day basis every 6 to 12 hours because there's some idea that as this uh, marker starts to go up in your blood that that may predict uh, uh, upcoming clinical deterioration that might prompt you to do something uh, more aggressive in terms of an intervention for that patient sooner. However, this really hasn't hit prime time yet. We're not, I don't know of any medical center that's using it uh, routinely, but it's actually being used in the, in, uh, the greatest frequency in the military, um, where there is very little access to uh, traumatic brain injury type centers and neurosurgeons, and uh, they're using this in the battlefield to try to get a sense of whether somebody's safe to go back out the next day or needs to be sent to another, uh, another unit to get further care. So how do we treat all these things? Well, there's a lot of different ways. I'm not going to get into this in too much depth, but the bottom line is a patient with any significant tra uh, traumatic brain injury should be at a trauma center. A lot of our care is supportive, uh, which means that we basically are trying to let their brain heal, and we're trying to keep their other systems going the way they should be. We will do a variety of interventions, like a craniotomy, which basically means taking the bone flap out to expose a hematoma and removing that hematoma before we put the bone flap back in. Sometimes if a patient has high pressures, we put a catheter into the fluid-filled spaces in their brain to drain their ventricles of spinal fluid. And we also give a lot of medications to try to help manage their intracranial pressure, too. But honestly, some of these things are not particularly effective. In particular, when we have patients with persistent elevations in intracranial pressure, um, we can sometimes throw everything that we have in the book at them and, uh, and still really not be very successful in getting that under control. And that's a point of great frustration for anybody that practices trauma and neurosurgery. So what are the long-term outcomes for these folks? Well, it's extremely variable, and that's really the bottom line. It's very hard to predict functional outcomes. It's very variable. I have given up trying to predict these outcomes to my patients, even though their families desperately want to hear uh, what I think is going to happen. I'm wrong more than I'm right, and uh, I finally just started saying that to them. But it's, that's very frustrating both for us and the patients, and it's a point of major research that's uh, ongoing at our medical center. Um, the bottom line is the brain is the slowest tissue to heal in the body, and so recovery lasts for months to years. Uh, these patients usually need intensive rehabilitation, and that's absolutely key to recovery. If they don't get it, they won't recover. It's not that it just delays. Uh, and this is also a really expensive process. Because these patients require such long-term rehabilitation, uh, direct costs of a severe brain injury range from one and a half to three million on average. And those are not the indirect costs of what happens to that family when that person's not working and the family members aren't working and have to change things around in the house eventually, et cetera. That's just what you're paying for the hospital. So this is an incredibly costly, serious problem. Um, I want to switch uh, angles just a little bit and speak for a bit more about concussion. This is, well, well, all of us may eventually see some sort of traumatic brain injury, you know, unfortunately, the long, as long as we stay in the sport. Um, they're relatively rare. Concussions, however, are very, very common. 
And I think if anybody rides with any frequency at all, you're going to wind up seeing somebody that's had a concussion. And knowing how to sort that out and what to, what to ask that person to do and how to help treat them is incredibly important. So concussions are real, it's a clinical diagnosis, um, which means it's not made based on a scan or a lab. It's made based on a history and a exam. So it's based on what, the, what symptoms the athlete says they have, uh, observing their behavior and their functions, and examining specific areas of brain function through the neurologic exam. There's an inherent problem here, which is that if someone's having a lot of symptoms and they lie to you because they're trying to get back on the horse, or they're in many cases in college and professional sports, they're trying to get back on the field, uh, you may not be able to, to uh, diagnose this correctly. So that's a challenge for those of us that take care of these folks. Uh, to, to diagnose a concussion, you really need an on-site assessment, which means you need these people assessed within five to ten minutes of their injury. Otherwise, things change rapidly. They may get much, much better. Their symptoms may go away. They may not remember exactly what symptoms they had, but they still may have had a significant concussion. You just lost the window to diagnose that. Uh, and then personnel trained to identify brain injury are obviously the ones who need to diagnose this. One of the common problems we talk about in uh, eventing a lot is whether EMTs who are present on the uh, grounds anytime we're jumping um, sh or can diagnose concussions. And most folks think that they do. The reality is that they usually they don't. Unless they've had specific training to identify brain injuries, that's really not part of their scope of practice. So that's not what they're checking you out for when they come to, you know, scoop you up off the cross-country course. They're checking you out for any major injuries that they think you need to transport to the hospital for, and that's it. So just because somebody's been checked out by the paramedics or the EMTs, and then you know, sent back to the barns doesn't mean they haven't suffered a concussion. And that's really a pet peeve of mine because there's a lot of confusion about that out there. That being said, you don't need to be a paramedic or an EMT to learn how to diagnose a concussion. I'm going to tell you guys basically how you do that. So first of all, you need to see an athlete that's had a fall or a hit within about five to ten minutes as soon as possible of that injury. And you're going to examine them for certain signs and symptoms. And this is a long list. Does the patient, does the athlete look dazed or stunned? Are they confused? That's a very, very common sign that, that should be an instant trigger. Do they forget what they were just doing, what the score of the game was, or what fence they were on, or what events they're at? Um, are they clumsy or unbalanced at all? Are they slow to answer questions? Loss of consciousness is a guarantee. Uh, diagnostic criteria for concussion, even if it's incredibly brief. Um, are they showing some behavioral changes? And then amnesia, forgetting events that happened just before the accident and forgetting events that happened after the accident and repeated questions are very common signs of concussion folks. In terms of symptoms, the number one symptom most people complain of is headache. Basically, if a headache lasts more than a minute or two after a blow to the head, you need to be very suspicious that a concussion has taken place. Somebody that's still complaining of a headache 15, 20 minutes later, I would diagnose as having at least a mild concussion. Oftentimes they'll have nausea, balance problems and dizziness, double vision, they'll be sensitive to light or noise. They commonly complain of feeling really slow or foggy uh, and fatigued. Oftentimes they'll be a little bit sleepy, uh, not necessarily to the point where they just want to pass out, but you know they just really want to get someplace where they can rest. If you have any one of these signs or symptoms within a few minutes of having had a, uh, a blow at the head or some other incident where you know, there may have been a brain injury, then you have a concussion. That's it. It only takes one of these things. So the most common symptoms are headaches, as I said, dizziness, and blurred vision. About half of folks will experience either cognitive or memory problems, so not everybody, but a lot, only 10% of folks that have a con diagnosed concussion actually had a loss of consciousness. So if you've had a loss of consciousness, you've had a pretty severe concussion. Certainly possible to have a severe one without that. Uh, I think it's important to realize in the overwhelming majority of cases, imaging modalities that we use commonly, CT and MRI, will be normal. That does not mean that you haven't had a very serious brain injury. CT and MRI are tests of structure, and a concussion is a problem with brain function. So even though someone's been to the emergency room and had a normal CT, it does not mean that they have not had a concussion. Uh, so how do we think about concussions these days? Well, we used to try to grade them, and we've basically given that up. So you'll hear me say mild, severe. Those are just kind of generic terms that are subjective. But we have uh, most physicians have decided that there's really not any good objective 
system for graded concussions, and it probably doesn't matter. Instead, we want to think about each concussion individually, and it's based on what types of symptoms someone had, how, se how severe they were, how many symptoms they had, and how long they lasted. It's also dependent on age. Younger people take longer to recover from a concussion, and they are more likely to have permanent or long-term damage. That's true of children over adolescents, of adolescents over young adults, of young adults over older adults. A patient's previous concussion history really matters. So somebody that's had multiple concussions is going to be uh, prone to having a lot longer recovery time than someone that hasn't. And we've also recently found that women are actually more susceptible to more severe brain injury and long-term uh, difficulties with concussion than in terms of long-term outcomes, again, um, in athletes, the duration of symptoms, of course, is very variable, but the average is about three and a half days. Most people are fully recovered within a week, but there's some group, around 10%, that are going to continue to have symptoms of some type one year after injury. Commonly, that's post-concussive headache, but we also see people that have intermittent double vision, intermittent dizziness, and intermittent cognitive or memory problems. This is really a key point the bottom of the slide. An athlete who sustains a concussion is four to six times more likely to sustain a second concussion than someone who's never had. So something about what happens to your brain causes a permanent functional change that means that you are prone to head injury again. And that's something that scares us. It's pretty scary when you think of those of us that ride and have had multiple concussions along the way. How do we treat these? Well, there's not a lot to do. The main thing is we give it time. The most effective strategy for preventing any more severe brain injury is just to avoid secondary hits to the head until the injury is completely healed. And that means there are no signs or symptoms remaining. Second impact syndrome is something that you may, may have heard about occasionally. This is what happens when someone's had a concussion, usually relatively mild, then they have another blow to the head within a short period of time and before their symptoms have cleared. And there have been a handful of cases reported of this. Uh, where someone has gone on to have an extreme amount of intracranial swelling and ultimately died from a, a, a second relatively small hit to the head. Uh, we think this happens because the brain stops uh, doing its normal auto-regulation of its blood supply. Uh, and as I said, these are incredibly uh, dangerous events when they occur. So this is one of the big reasons that we worry about people that go back to dangerous activities too soon. Uh, in a big study of Division I college football, they studied folks that uh, had had a concussion and then returned to play prior to the complete resolution of their symptoms. A third of those kids had uh, delayed onset of additional symptoms that then lasted weeks to months versus about 12% of folks that had a concussion and did not return um, in, 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 until their symptoms were completely gone. Those folks they had, did continue to have delayed onset of additional symptoms, but um, it was a much smaller smaller proportion. So how do other sports handle this uh, outside the equestrian world? Well, uh, if you play football or soccer or lacrosse or any number of things in this country, uh, after a suspicious hit or a fall, most athletes will get examined on the sidelines by an athletic trainer or a team doctor if you're talking about professional sports. But usually this is an athletic trainer who's just trained how to diagnose these things. If that screening exam demonstrates some suspicious signs or symptoms, then the athlete's supposed to be pulled from the game, and then they're sent for further testing, usually at the hospital. Uh, that process really takes about five to ten minutes, basically asking some questions, watching them for a little while, seeing how they do, and it's highly effective at diagnosing a concussion. There's a, a group of questions that were published in 1995 as an outline of basically a set of questions that are, are found to be highly effective at diagnosing. Uh, so you'll have an athlete, these are the Questions athletic trainers use on the sidelines commonly. Basically, what field are we playing on? What team are we playing? Who's your opponent? What period is it? Who scored the last point? What team did we play last week? And basically, this is just trying to test somebody's cognitive abilities and their short term and intermediate term memory to make sure that everything's working the way it's supposed to be. So, if somebody ha pops up as, uh, on that screening exam of having some signs or symptoms that you're concerned about, well, what do you do with them? Well, they may get seen in the emergency room. They may just get seen by the team doctor. And uh, then they're going to be set out, out, out of uh, play for a little while. And determining when somebody's ready to return to play is one of the big challenges. We know, first and foremost, that they have to have complete resolution of their symptoms before they should come back to play 
and before they should be taking on any other activities that put them at high risk for a second hit. However, sometimes somebody feels fine, but they're actually not quite ready yet. And the way that we measure that objectively in many settings is by using neurocognitive testing. The impact test is something that's available. Uh, it's an online test that many subscribers use to try to determine when somebody's ready to go back. Basically, you do a baseline test for yourself um, when you join a team, for example, or you get to your school where you're going to play Division I football. And then when you've had a suspicious injury and you feel like you're ready to go back, then you come back and you take this test again. And it, it does a really good job of measuring your working memory, your attention, reaction time, and all those kinds of things that are affected by concussion to give the doctor an idea of whether everything's working the way it should be. And this tries to get around that issue of the you know, issue of uh, honesty in symptom reporting, especially in athletes that want to get back to the field of play sooner than they should. So current impact test users include all the NFL teams, all the NHL teams, most Major League Baseball teams, some of the NBA, all Major League Soccer teams, Formula One, uh, many U.S. Olympic teams, over 100 U.S. universities, and the U.S. Eventing High Performance Squad, which is something that our group rolled out a couple years ago. We started testing folks um, and getting baseline exams at, uh, in concussion history at Rolex a few years ago, and this is something that we've continued to do. And I'm hoping this will serve as a pilot program for other equestrian sports. So what do you do when someone's passed their pass the test, doctor thinks they're okay to go back to play? Well, you know, first of all, you're going to start with some light aerobic exercise. You're going to see how that goes. If any of their symptoms come back, then they stop. Then you're going to start slowly escalating their activity level before they go ever go back onto the field uh, for an actual competition. And once they've shown that they can get through competition level play uh, without any recurrence of their symptoms, then they're ready to go back. How long that takes is highly variable. For some people it's going to be a couple weeks. For some people it, that could all be accomplished within two days. So how do other sports handle this? Well, the 2010 NCAA rules had an addition which said that student athletes diagnosed with concussions shall not return to activity for the remainder of that day. Medical clearance shall be determined by the team physician or their designee according to the concussion management plan. And as I've already showed you, most of the time that's going to involve some neurocognitive test against their baseline as well as a specific concussion exam. So the bottom line here, which is, is kind of horrifying for us equestrians is that there's policies in place within major sports organizations around this country and all published practice parameters for medical professionals support this type of testing as a standard of care for athletes that have a concussion. However, in the equestrian community, there's basically crickets on this subject. And we have a routine problem of people in competition suffering from injuries and being able to potentially get right back on another horse, get right back on that horse, uh, without any evaluation whatsoever. And I think this is a, both an enormous education issue, a health issue, and a, and a legal issue as well that our sport has really hesitated to face. So here's the part where I get on my soapbox very briefly. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are possible solutions to this problem, uh, just to kind of have them out there and, and hopefully uh, stir up some interest in potentially supporting some changes in the way that we do things. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of solutions that are involved, I think, for both prevention, detection, and treatment. And I think the key point here is this is a problem that's both educational and legislative. So, you know, in terms of riders nationally, most injuries are happening in people's backyards. They're recreational riders, oftentimes they don't have, you know, a, as much education about the need to wear a helmet, et cetera. Um, and so part of the issue is reaching out to those kinds of people, and that's, I think, a huge part of what we need to do. But there's also a legislative issue, which is, it involves our major equestrian organizations, and I think if the major equestrian organizations don't support policies that absolutely minimize the risk of these severe injuries in riders, it's kind of hard to expect most backyard riders to take it that seriously either, because clearly at the highest level it's not necessarily taken seriously. So, in terms of prevention, first of all, you know, this is International Helmet Awareness Day, and uh, uh, the <laughs> that's a key component of this talk. So, absolutely, the number one way to avoid, the only way to avoid head injuries other than never getting on a horse is to wear a helmet. 
Uh, helmets have been shown to reduce the risk of severe brain injury in all sports where you use both contact and non-contact sports. There are many examples worldwide where mandatory helmet laws have reduced severe brain injury and neurologic deaths. This is just something that shouldn't be debated anymore. The research is very, very clear. However, there is increasing evidence that shows that while helmets are really, really effective at reducing the risk of severe TBI, they may not be as effective at reducing the risk of concussion. And it's, it's becoming something of a, a problem, of an engineering problem, um, where we're, the more we understand about concussions and their relationship to rotational acceleration, we realize that the components of a helmet that are so good at shielding the head from a, a, a catastrophic blow may not be the components of a helmet that you would want to protect the head from a concussion. And this is a, a big issue across a number of sports. So what can we do about this? Well, we need to continue to advocate for more research and better standards and not assume that what we have right now is as good as it can get because I think there's an opportunity to uh, make helmets much, much better. We also need to keep asking the helmet manufacturers to build us a better product and, and let them know that while you know, some, we may sometimes be concerned about the way the helmet looks and the way it's ventilated and what pretty colors it comes in, what we're really concerned with is finding a helmet that protects us just a little bit better than the other one on the shelf. And uh, we need to let the helmet manufacturers to know that that's important to us and to know that you know, we're willing to potentially pay in to, uh, to, to support the research that is going to allow us to be safer. I also think it's absolutely critical that we legislate helmet use in competition. And this is a challenging topic. Um, as an event rider, you know, this is somewhat more of a popular feeling in our world than in certainly in other, um, other organized equestrian sports. But when your backyard riders turn on the TV and they watch the dressage riders at the Olympics and they see that they're not wearing helmets, well, they say to themselves, hey, if the best riders in the world who have access to the best safety equipment in the world don't feel like it's necessary, why should I feel like it's necessary? Uh, at the same time, you know, when, the, when your backyard western rider gets a chance to come to the WEG and watch these in, incredible reigning competition and they see these folks that they um, think of as, you know, in, as, as role models, uh, not thinking that it's important enough to wear a helmet, well, you know, what message do they get from that? So I think the first thing that we need to do, painful as it may be in some areas, is really have a serious conversation about legislating helmet use on competition grounds in all organized horse sports. I also think then it would be a little bit easier to start educating riders about wearing helmets in training or recreational settings. If you see everybody doing it all around you at the shows, it's just that much easier to remember to do it at home. If it doesn't seem to matter to the big people who are your role models, then it's not going to necessarily matter to you. In terms of detection, I think riders need to be treated like the athletes they are. Uh, a fall should be followed by a mandatory screening evaluation when you fall in competition. And obviously lots of falls occur at home, uh, but you know, for those that occur in competition, we need to let people know that that's potentially really important. These screening evaluations can be done in five to ten minutes. People who are you know, just common officials or, uh, or lay people can be trained very quickly to diagnose or screen for a possible concussion. I think that that should be happening at our competitions and that failure of that screening evaluation or refusal to take part of it should mean that you don't ride again during that competition on any horse. That's an enormous challenge and something that I think is not very popular. But uh, I, I think that if we want to call riders athletes and we want to talk about how this is a challenging athletic endeavor, we've got to treat riders like the, all the other athletes in this country are treated. I think a one-hour training session could be created on a diagnosis of concussion, could be available online through a webinar, could be available at annual meetings of the organizations, and could be part of an instructor certification program, part of the Pony Club, et cetera, so that people, trainers, coaches, lay people, anybody that's interested, parents, could learn some of these skills and then use them when they're in their backyard, use them when they're having lessons, use them in a clinic when somebody has a fall. In terms of treatment, I think that we also need to look to the other sports that have been can be an example for us. 
and try to figure out what to do when a rider is suspected to have a, a concussion in competition. I think they should be referred to a formal return to play system. Impact testing is one route to make that feasible. Uh, the uh, eventing, U.S. Eventing uh, Association has, has worked on that a little bit with their high performance riders and I think that's really exciting. The bottom line is you've got to get the organizations on board. Uh, impact testing costs, uh, well, it depends, but you know, if you have an organization that is supporting it, you can often get a lot of discounts. I'll say in our Vanderbilt Concussion Center, we have a program where we will take any recreational, school, or professional athlete anywhere in the Nashville area that wants to come and join us and come in, get an initial screening, do an impact baseline test, and then can come back and see us again for repeat testing if they ever have an injury, and we charge $50 out of pocket for that. So we're not talking about a, a huge amount of money, although obviously it is a lot of money on an individual basis to think about putting into this. I think you could probably negotiate a way through the USEF or other organizations of that type where you could get impact testing available you know, on the order of 20 to $30 per member. And uh, I think that's something that we need to ask our organizations to think about. So. Um, I've talked for a long time and I appreciate your attention and, and uh, your interest. Just to summarize, head injury in equestrians is a major systemic problem. Education and prevention, education of the type we're doing today, prevention uh, in the way of helmets are absolutely key, but they're only part of the solution. And I do believe it's time that we have to treat riders like the athletes they are and uh, bring our sport in line with the other major sports out there and uh, use what they've learned so that we can make our sport safer for all of us. And briefly, I'd just like to say thank you to Lindsay for asking me to speak today, and um, the Riders for Helmets, who have done an incredible amount of work, and also my colleague, Alan Sills, who uh, is a mentor to me in this area, and the late Craig Farrell, who's an orthopedic surgeon and rider, who uh, was the one who got me into all of this in the first place. And I just wanted to um, put our, our website up there for those of you in the future that want to take a look. We have a lot of uh, information about sports concussions on our Concussion Center website. This uh, gets into a lot of the details about, you know, about uh, how we do these evaluations, a lot of frequently asked questions, um, and also has a lot of links to some of the research programs and recently published research that's out there that I encourage anybody that's interested to take a look at. And with that, uh, Lindsay, I'm happy to take any questions. Or no, I actually don't, Tisha. Unless if you want to put your, that last slide back up for one moment and then people can maybe note that down if they didn't quite catch it there. Absolutely. Yep, there we go. Um, I don't even know where to start with the questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, so, so much. That was such an insightful and educational presentation. And um, th there are multiple questions that have come in on email. So if I may, I'm, I, and, you, and you have a few more moments, I'd like to just ask you a couple of them. Um, yep. it, it seems to be almost, uh, and this was a question I was actually going to ask you, but it's come, on, come in on email as well. But it's almost like it's a hidden secret or this dirty little secret in the equestrian world about these head injuries and the the number of head injuries that are experienced. And I don't understand, and I'm baffled, as are other people that I've talked with as well, about why do we not get any national press for this? Obviously, there's the money in American football, the sponsorship and everything else. But on the scale, when you look at the sheer number of head injuries that are experienced in the equestrian world, what do you think it's going to take to get national coverage and somebody to actually write an article on it? I think it's a really good question. I think part of the problem is, you know, equestrian sports in general don't get a lot of national press um, and are sort of looked at as, you know, A, not a real sport, you know, or, or sort of a, you know, affluent person's hobby, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, we all know that's not the case. Um, but I think that's part of the issue. You know, it, it, it strikes me as funny. You know, I'm obviously very tuned into these stories that come up. And in the last year, I have seen so many stories about girls playing soccer and the head injuries that they're suffering from that. Yeah. And uh, it's a real issue. And it's a newly sort of newly understood issue and, and concussions that are happening, especially in female soccer players, um, I and mean, a much higher rate than we ever thought before. And I think that gets pressed because. You know, there's there's lots of girls out there playing soccer, and there's lots of parents that are interested in that question. You know, there are not lots of girls out there dying from head injuries in soccer games. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably just a volume issue on some on some level. Right. Right. 
Um, another question as well, and, and it came in about the impact testing, but obviously you, you touched on that and explained an overview of what the impact testing is. But th this was just from a personal perspective, but I was a little surprised. It wasn't at the USCA convention last year. I believe it was the year before when Dr. Sills was there at the same time as me. And mm -hmm. he was trying to encourage, as was the USCA, the riders that were attending the annual meeting to sign up for the impact testing because they had it on site. And I talked with a couple of people and I said, why are you not paying this nominal fee? And I think it was around $30 at that particular meeting to have it done. To have this impact test, this is huge because if you ever fall off again, they've got a baseline and they've got some, something to work with. And it was almost a bit of a fear of, is it going to hurt? What, you know, almost yeah. apprehension as to what the test actually is, or is it going to be bad that I've got that on record from an insurance yeah. standpoint? Or So I'm just wondering, how people, do we encourage people and take the kind of um, apprehension away from the test? Absolutely. I think people worry that it will be used to keep them from getting back to competition when they want to. And, and the, I mean, there's some reason for that worry, I suppose. The reality is most people in most sports suffer a sports-related concussion and go through the impact testing process, are back to, retur you know, are returning to play within three or four days. So, you know, the impact test is not going to sit you down for six weeks unless you really need to be sat down for six weeks. But I think people have that fear that then, you know, if we mandate this, that it's going to keep them from getting back on and being able to compete at the next, you know, the next weekend. And certainly for professionals and for upper level riders, you know, that, that's, that's where, you know, that's the only way they're making an income. Right. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's frightening. The problem, the really frightening thing though, is that, you know, all you're doing by not using resources like that is actually really long term putting your career in enormous jeopardy. Uh, and that's, I think, what is, it, it just seems like the easier path, but in reality, it's the much, much more dangerous path. Right, right. I think that's a very good perspective. Um, another, another question that's uh, come in, because it was obviously somebody that listened to one of our webinars earlier today, and we talked about helmets, and we did praise helmets um, from the sense that they're stopping more severe injuries in other words if you didn't have a helmet on at all you might perhaps suffer a tbi or you know actually die you know not wearing a helmet but mm -hmm. that, and we talked about how we're probably seeing more concussions because there are more people wearing helmets but at the end of the day when they fall off they're having a concussion versus a tbi um, right. So from that perspective, that's probably why we're seeing an increased reporting in the number of concussions versus the fact that it's a problem with the actual helmets. I agree with you. I think there's a lot to be done in terms of the design to make them um, to, to make to, to make them protect against concussions because right now they're really protecting against TBIs and death. Ultimately, it, not that you can stop somebody dying in every circumstance, obviously, but um, just from your perspective. Um, you know, again, how do we reach out to the helmet companies to just say, OK, we've got something that right now is superb, but perhaps reducing the risk of TBIs. But what do we do about concussion? We, is, it a, a, is it a joint process where um, people in the medical field need to actually work in conjunction with the helmet companies or how what's the best approach there? I do. I mean, I think it, it's something that's going to require, you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons and engineers and the helmet companies because. You know, the, the, the problem we have now is, you know, we have a pretty good standard um, for helmets and, you know, for equestrian helmets in this country. It's the ASTM standard, which I've studied extensively for a couple of consulting jobs and whatnot. And it's a great standard. And I think it really does, you know, give us, a, you know, our helmet manufacturers are giving us, in, you know, inexpensive helmets that do a really good job of perfect, protecting us against serious injury and death. The problem is that the materials needed to prevent concussions are probably going to wind up being very different and unfortunately we don't have a standard out there yet that really addresses that issue so I think in some ways we're kind of asking the helmet manufacturers to sort of come up on with something on their own and yet still meet those ASDM standards and that's that's I can imagine a big challenge for them yeah. um, I think that part of it is going to be you know sort of a re continued revision to that AT ASTM standard to try to get some new data in there about how, you know, we handle rotational acceleration, for example, rather than, you know, just dropping a helmet on an anvil. Uh, but it's probably going to take a really novel engineering, um, you know, finding, too, to come up with materials that are able to do both. 
And it's a problem that's going on in other sports as well. I just read a really interesting article in Bicycling Magazine uh, that was uh, basically about the exact same thing. And, you know, despite increased helmet use over the last decade, you know, they've seen increases in the number of bicycle riders having concussions. Now, probably, they've also seen a decrease in the number of, you know, folks that are dying of those accidents. And so it's not that helmets are causing concussions. And I definitely don't want anyone to take that away from this because I truly do not believe that they are in any way, shape, or form. But we are probably unmasking more mild head injuries by preventing more severe head injuries. And, uh, you know, I think one thing the helmet manufacturers need to hear from all of us is that a, a slightly safer helmet really matters. And, you know, I would be willing to pay, you know, an extra $40, $50 for a helmet that's a little bit safer than the one sitting next to it. And uh, I don't know if they know that necessarily about us or, or about, you know, um, I don't know that we have the data about most equestrians and how they feel about that. But I think that understanding that might help push us in that direction. Right. Um, Patty has a great question. She's asking, how, is, how can I, as an event rider, help advocate for stricter policies on assessing riders after a fall? That is a great question <laughs> and one that I struggle with myself. I think it's uh, a question of all of us coming together, to per perhaps for that goal, isn't exactly. it, really? You know, I sit on the USEF Safety Committee now. And um, we dealt with a, a lot of issues about the one fall rule in eventing recently. And I personally, uh, and I don't speak for the committee and I say this, but I personally don't believe that a rider should fall, be able to fall off on cross country and without any evaluation remount to continue on that horse, regardless of the level, regardless of how they fall, regardless of who witnesses it, et cetera. I think it's just really dangerous both you know, medically and legally, and I think it's ultimately going to end in a tragedy somewhere. That being said, you know, unfortunately, or well, you know, uh, maybe fortunately, most of the uh, most of the eventing community doesn't agree with me about that. And um, I think I think part of the issue is probably an education issue. I think another part of it is that uh, people are reluctant to envision how, you know, what kinds of changes that we could make relatively simply to allow a process like that to take place. I also think there's a lot of pushback from riders that are trying to ride multiple horses uh, that, you know, are have extremely busy schedules that are making their living uh, by teaching and riding at events who uh, are, you know, terrified by the idea that they could go and have a brief evaluation and be told they can't ride any of the rest of their, you know, advanced horses for the rest of the weekend. And I certainly understand how that's a, a huge issue. Um, but I wish that more people would kind of get behind us in, in the uh, in looking at do, uh, finding a way to create a program through the USEA or the USEF that would um, at least potentially a pilot program that would allow us to kind of start instituting some kind of screening process like this. It's just, it's just appalling to me that, you know, a lacrosse player, well, actually, here's really the best example. If you ride horses in an NCAA competition uh, as a college athlete and you fall off, it's mandatory that you go through that whole process because you're, it's an NCAA rule. And they have that process in place. If a rider falls off at a, at a you know, NCAA horse show, they should be screened. They, you know, that's an NCAA guideline. And yet... You know, a rider at Badminton or Rolex Kentucky uh, that falls off, you know, maybe hopping right back on another horse later on in the day without any evaluation. And that just is kind of mind-boggling to me. Well, hey, I'm going to volunteer there. I'm going to say that if you help me just put something together that I can put on the website, Dr. Shambliss, I'm going to put a petition together. And I, I, I'm volunteering for yet another job here. But we'll see where that goes. Watch this space, Patty, because we're going to see where that goes. You'll see something on Riders for Helmets shortly about that, no doubt. Uh, two more very, very quick questions, if, if you don't mind possibly, Dr. Shambles, just two more. Um, we had Lisa Lazarus from the FEI on this morning talking about the current helmet rules. And I do have to applaud the FEI that they did take the step first step in the right direction to uh, implement a, a helmet rule in January this year, albeit, you know, every, as everybody, as we've discussed, we'd like them to take the next step. And when most of the top dressage riders are now wearing helmets and take Charlotte Desjardins at the Olympics last year, winning, you know, with a helmet on, um, yeah. it follows that probably there's going to be more discussions at the table and perhaps some more rules coming in anyway. The, what, the one area where I think 
obviously we all know we're going to have more of a challenge is obviously in western disciplines um i think there's some great programs out there and this is more of a comment to see how we can all come to get together to dis start discussions here but um a lady who attended one of the last um safety symposiums kathy slack she has started a program down in in texas where she has physically bought helmets at cost and she goes to show she's very successful in her own right in the western world so people know of her and know who she is and she literally goes up and talks to parents that are uh, leading the kids around on quarter horses and whatnot with no helmets on. And by the end of the day, the child's got a helmet on the head. Now, I'm not saying um, we obviously to replicate that on a mass scale. It, it's very limited because you can maybe only talk to five or six people at a show. Um, mm -hmm. But there are people out there that have started kind of the on hands approach. Um, I wonder, you know, how we get somebody like the National Reining Association or somebody like that to sit down and actually have a discussion at the table with us. I'm just throwing that out there for a <laughs> future discussion. I don't know that's going to happen at this time, but um, um, certainly, you know, I think we have to at some point look more at the Western disciplines. I totally agree. And, uh, you know, I, I think I would love to think that someday in the relatively near future, you know, that they would be welcoming to just having a talk about head injuries, you know, in their national meetings and those kinds of things and trying to, you know, just start from the grassroots effort of at least getting some education and awareness out there. I think, you know, targeting parents is key. As a parent myself now, you know, uh, I would do absolutely anything to keep my child safe. And so when I see parents walking around with kids that aren't wearing helmets, I think, you know, they just must, they, they must just not know. And it's not that they're, you know, it's not that they're stupid. It's not that they don't care. It's that they just don't know what kind of danger they're talking about. I mean, they're, you know, they're strapping their kids down in the world's safest car seat and they're sticking them on the back of a horse without a helmet on. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is just going to be the very beginning level education um, yeah. in the community, which I would hope would be helpful. Oh, and Patty's just messaged us saying, um she's she's in with us on that dr shambliss on that petition on the website and we're the three of us make something happen there, so <laughs> <Thanks. there>. um <laughs> very last question just and this is kind of a heart-wrenching question uh question more for comments from you if we may just to end it uh -huh. i want to be clear you, you mentioned and we've discussed before the financial costs of traumatic brain injuries being between about one and a half and three million dollars um uh -huh. on a per case basis obviously it doesn't just stop there, though, does it? It's the emotional cost. Um, as Sally Stewart, I think, said at the meeting that you attended in Kentucky, you know, um, the financial cost is one thing. The emotional cost is something else. You will bankrupt yourself emotionally. Um, yes. And then there's also the, the family to consider as well, because ultimately they become your caregivers should you be unfortunate enough to have a TBI and not able to take care of yourself. And Lyndon Gray put it very well when she said, you know, if you get on a horse without a helmet, have you asked two things? One, does my family have enough money to look after me? Because not everybody's quite so lucky as Courtney that they're an Olympian and fundraisers happen for them. Um, mm -hmm. Or they indeed even have insurance, if any. Um, and secondly, um, you know, have you asked your family if you'd be prepared to be care caregivers, you know, for, for me if, if I fall off and have an accident not wearing a helmet? So I know I know as a as a, a leading neurosurgeon, you know, you, you fix people and you put them back together, but you also see that at the hospital too, the... Um, the emotional and the family how affected they are and I just kind of as a final thought I didn't know if you had anything kind of to share on that because clearly it must get to you as well I'm sure even though as a as a, a surgeon you have to be somewhat immune to it because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do your job but it, it must get to you I would imagine as well absolutely I mean um, you know I I take call uh, in our trauma center once every eight or nine nights and, you know, on most of those nights, um, we'll get somebody, a, often a young person, you know, from their 20s, 30s, who comes in with a severe brain injury that's not going to survive, but that's going to survive in a very, very terrible way. And uh, so I have those conversations with family members all the time. Uh, it's just an incredible tragedy because some, one, I mean, the great frustration is how many of these things are preventable. Uh, and certainly that's true of helmet use, but it's also true of drunk driving. It's true of you know, a lot of the ways that people hurt themselves. Um, I mean, there is just no, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, there, uh, there's a picture in one of the previous presentations I gave of myself riding in a two-star, 
I was 18 in a top, you know, a top hat in uh, the dressage. And uh, I used to always wear a helmet, a pony clubber, et cetera. But, you know, when I was going to ride in the two-star in the dressage, well, I was, you know, finally earned the right to wear my top hat. Well, it, it didn't take very long of doing what I do to make me realize how incredibly foolish and lucky that was. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, pe people in that scenario, when I sit down with a family member, family and tell them, you know, their loved one is in critical condition with severe brain injury and I can't predict how, whether they're going to live or die and how they're going to live, you know, they would do anything to change that situation. They would give anything, they would do anything to make that go away. And the challenge that faces all of us is making people see that before it happens, when they have the opportunity to do something and not letting it ever get to that point. Um, you know, we, we see patients who have incredible, miraculous recoveries. It's so exciting. And sometimes they're patients that I've operated on and sometimes they're patients I've observed um, and haven't operated on and they just do amazingly. But I all, for every one of those, I have about 10 who, who don't have miraculous recovery. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be brutally honest here, you know, the ones that you lose when they're in the hospital, it's very, very sad, but it's actually not the saddest. The, the saddest are the ones that survive in a way where they can never communicate, they can never uh, take care of any aspect of their own care. Um, they have numerous, you know, innumerous complications and readmissions to the hospital over many, many, many years, wearing out the all, all the capacity of their families, the financial capacity, the emotional capacity. You know, you see families, you know, divorce and breaking apart and and um, families torn apart trying to care for this loved one of theirs. And um, that's that's the part that just absolutely breaks your heart. And when you see those situations in you know in situations like um, riders that have fallen, it, it, it breaks your heart because it, it is for people. And uh, that's, you know, that's one of the great challenges of the job. Um, it's one of those things that as neurosurgeons we don't think about too often because if we did it would, <laughs> we would be very depressed. I'm, I'm so sorry that I brought that up and, and I hope I haven't caused any. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a part of the job and I actually, I consider it an enormous privilege to be a part of people's mm. lives at that point because as I far just, as I'm I, I, and I am sorry to open up that question because I know it is hard because I know you have to, to some extent, block it out because you wouldn't be able to do your job. But I just wanted from a physician's standpoint, for a surgeon's standpoint, for people to hear that. And you just gave the best answer that you ever could. Um, <laughs> and I want to spread that as much as I can because it doesn't just stop with you operating on somebody and then they go away. You see the other side of it. You see the family. You see... The patients readmitted multiple times to the hospitals and um you know honestly you couldn't have phrased that any better you really couldn't and um I, I do want to share that and i want to make sure that that specific message as well as the rest of your presentation does get out because i think that's hugely important for people to hear Absolutely. because i know people if they could look back and say i could have bought a 50 dollar helmet and things could have been the outcome could have been very different i know oh, yeah. you would give the right arm for that you know so yeah. um I, I think that's that's so important to get that message out there. So yeah. thank you so, so much, Dr. Shambliss, not just for joining us today, but I would like to tell everybody on the call, everybody on the webinar, how immensely supportive you have been of Riders for Helmets, how supportive Dr. Sills has been, how supportive the late and great and wonderful, and we all miss him, Dr. Farrell was. Um, I think it's a testament to all of your support combined that Riders for Helmets is where it's at now. Courtney sharing a story. I mean, it's amazing to me that in our fourth year of doing Helmet Awareness Day, third year of it being international, that we have um, tax shops in eight countries on board. We have the National Federation of Horse Sports um, globally, you know, literally talking about it and getting behind it. And it's everybody coming together, and that message goes out to you, Patty, <laughs> um, that makes these things happen. And I think together as riders, you know, we can achieve even more than we have already, but we have to just come together as one united voice. And I just so appreciate um, your part in that and Dr. Sill's part in that. Well, thank you. It's just been a privilege to be involved with such an amazing organization and people who, who feel so strongly about such an important issue. So. I really appreciate you asking me to take part. 
Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. As a last reminder, if you haven't gone out and bought a new hat today, please don't forget you've got until the end of the day to do so. Um, ridersforhelmets.com backslash IHAD. There's hundreds of retailers on that map. They're all offering discounts today. Please, if you buy a hat, whether it's online or in a tax shop, show your appreciation for them taking part because without the retailers and the helmet manufacturers, this day would not happen. Um, thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, we will get these webinars up on the website shortly. Um, and with that, we're going to thank Dr. Shambliss one more time and um, wish everybody a, rest, a great rest of the weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you.